the report of the airship hindenburg accident investigation by the united states department of commerce this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain part five the combustible mixture and its ignition having retraced the course of events and circumstances surrounding the accident we come to the question why did the fire occur as yet with a few exceptions to be noted no more has been provided than a hypothetical approach to the answer we have weighed the several theories that have been advanced sabotage the possibility that the cause is to be explained by premeditated or willful act has received active attention sabotage has been examined under two classifications the first external including the use of incendiary bullet high-powered electric ray and the dropping of an igniting composition upon the ship from an aeroplane the second classification internal including the placing within the ship of a bomb or other infernal device to date there is no evidence to indicate that sabotage produced the grim result accidental causes in a consideration of accidental causes two factors must be found together there must be present a a combustible mixture of hydrogen and oxygen of the air and b sufficient heat to ignite such mixture in the analysis of the evidence the mixture and its ignition are treated separately presence of combustible mixture of hydrogen and air accumulation through diffusion or osmosis while it is conceded that the fabric of which the cells were made is slightly permeable to the diffusion of the contained hydrogen it is not our opinion that this characteristic of the cell walls under the circumstances prevailing would account for a combustible accumulation of gas and air within the ship the normal rate of seepage being as was indicated under description of the cells about one liter per square meter per twenty-four hours failure of valve mechanism according to the testimony only one valve failure had occurred on the ship this happened when the ship was new as a consequence certain changes had been made in the construction of the mechanism in any event the failure noted occurred to an automatic or pressure relief valve which would not have been functioning at the time of this accident however because the valves were mechanical devices it was possible that there might have been a defect or failure in them but no testimony appears to show that this possibility was a likely one. Decreased Ventilation Another query regarding the presence of such mixture presented itself. Could it have been due to the reduced scavenging of the gas by the ship's ventilation system during the last minutes of the craft's existence, when its speed eventually had been reduced to a full stop combined with the last valving operation about six minutes before the fire this theory seems improbable because of what was said about the efficiency of the ventilation system and because of the fact that the chimney effect created by the six-knot wind that was blowing at the ship's elevation during the last four minutes prior to the fire should have evacuated practically all of the gas from the shafts the forward speed of the ship reported to have been from fifteen to twenty miles per hour when the last valving operation was performed 
should have been ample it was stated to have cleared the gas rapidly from the ship a further argument made with regard to the scavenging of gas was that immediately after the last reported valving the ship's engines were backed down hard and that this deceleration should have tended to move the gas in the ship toward the bow and out through the forward gas shafts in considering the production of such mixture by the rupture of a cell or cells there are at least several avenues to explore entry of piece of propeller one of these might have been laid to the failure of a propeller and the throwing of one of its fragments through the adjacent part of the hull into a cell to this possibility there was devoted an extensive examination by experts of our staff and those of other agencies the condition of the propeller of engine car number two attracted our attention witness f w caldwell one of the country's foremost propeller experts was quite certain that the propeller of the afterport engine did not break in flight but was shattered at the time the car struck the ground he said that there was no indication of the separation of the sheathing from the blades except as the result of shattering on impact witness Deutsche, machinist in the afterport engine car indicated that the propeller of his car was still rotating when it struck the ground that he did not feel any unusual vibration of the engine before the crash fracture of hull wire one other significant possibility must be discussed while the question of cell rupture is being examined it was suggested that while in flight a tension wire might have ripped a hole in a cell and thus permitted a quantity of gas to escape coupled to this possibility is the testimony of witness r h ward digested briefly in the statement of facts that he saw a fluttering in the outer cover above the equator between rings sixty two and seventy seven and believed that this fluttering was caused by gas escaping into the space between the adjoining cell and the outer cover a shear wire in one of the panels at the place from which the gas was escaping could have snapped while the ship was turning during the landing maneuver witness eckener stated that such turns generate high stress in the after part of the ship especially in the center section close to the stabilizing fins which are braced by shear wires the gas thus accumulated between the cells in the outer cover must have been a rich mixture such a mixture enclosed in a space between the outer cover and the gas cells would if ignited burn with relatively slow speed until gas in greater volume was released by the burning through of the cell walls witness rosendahl recalled that in the early years of operation with naval aircraft shear wires had broken with varying effect causing no serious damage however major structural failure consideration has been given to the possibility that a major structural failure in the stern of the ship caused the hydrogen to be liberated by rupturing a cell and forcefully breaking an electric lead or metal part thus producing a spark the fire broke out when the port trail rope which held the ship to the ground became taut it was reported by some persons that at or about the time they observed the fire they heard a cracking sound from the stern of the ship an examination of the wreckage disclosed that the rivets by which the after end of the axle corridor was connected through a fitting to the hull had pulled out 
that all of the radial wires in the small frame nearest the stern had broken in tension that only a few of the small tabs of metal from the periphery of the frame which had been pulled off the bight formed where the radial wires hooked on to the frame were found on the ground below where the frame struck the shearing of the rivets and the condition of the wire in the frame might be explained by the force with which the rear end hit the ground or by the torsional or other stresses which the tail suffered in its last moments in the air it has also been pointed out that the ship was stressed for greater loads than the tensional strength of the bow trail rope and that the rope had not parted furthermore it was observed that the eye through which the trail rope was attached to the ship and the longitudinal member to which the eye was affixed were intact after the accident the four members of the crew in the stern of the ship testified that they did not hear or see any such structural failure prior to the fire ignition of the mixture many of the theoretic aspects of the ignition of the combustible mixture were dealt with at great length by a number of experts only a summary of this phase of the investigation is related in this report mechanical if there had been enough heat generated by the friction of wires or other members of the ship coming forcibly into contact with each other due to structural failure or breaking a sufficiently hot spark might have been produced to set off such mixture there is insufficient evidence to sustain a conclusion based upon this theory chemical as has been stated there are metals which have a catalytic effect upon a mixture of hydrogen and air and would materially lower its ordinary ignition temperature but it does not appear that any such metal was in that part of the ship where the fire was first observed under the title of chemical possibilities there has also been suggested that a flame might have been produced by spontaneous combustion the evidence is inadequate to support this theory thermodynamic in the examination of thermodynamic possibilities much time at the outset of the investigation was given to the possibility of such mixture being ignited by the sparks from the engine exhausts it was suggested that sparks or larger particles of carbon thrown out from the diesel engines might have been carried into the openings in the lower part of the hull or have been blown over the exterior of the stern and there have ignited such mixture while the circulation of the exhaust gases set up by the direction of rotation of the propellers just before the accident the after engines idling in reverse and the forward engines idling ahead was different from that produced while under way it was maintained by the german experts that this circumstance would not result in sparks or carbon particles reaching the interior of the hall and furthermore that the sparks would not have been able to ignite such mixture on the top of the ship at least one hundred and sixty-five feet away from the after exhaust outlets witness ludwig Dürr testified that very extensive experiments respecting this possibility had been conducted by the builders and the results had been reassuring when the engines are delivering eleven hundred to twelve hundred horsepower the temperature leaving the piston before it enters the exhaust stack is five hundred 
to 530 degrees centigrade. The temperature of the exhaust is lower. The engines ordinarily develop 800 to 850 horsepower. At this output, the temperature of the exhaust gases is 450 degrees to 480 degrees back of the cylinder. With a mixture of air sucked in, the temperature is reduced to 230 degrees to 250 degrees centigrade. Visible sparks have a temperature over 500 degrees centigrade, but lose their heat rapidly as they are impelled through the air. Had this been the cause of the ignition, it is believed that it would have come into play before the elapse of the four-minute interval between the dropping of the trail ropes and the accident. That the heat of the exhaust gases caused the havoc is also improbable. If ignition had happened at the exhaust, it would have been necessary that the temperature of the band of air between the outlets and the place of the first flame would have had to be about 507 degrees centigrade. According to witness Durer, the temperature at the exhaust outlets was much lower than 507 degrees centigrade. With the Hindenburg and the Graf Zeppelin, no difficulties had been experienced from this quarter. Electrical Under the classification of electrical sources of ignition, several were considered. A combustible mixture of air and hydrogen could have been ignited by the overheating of wires carrying current within the ship e.g. by short circuit. Barring the possibility previously alluded to of a substantial failure in the stern structure of the ship, which might have produced a sudden breaking of such wires in the aft end of the ship, it is thought to have been only remotely possible that the mixture was fired by a defect or failure of the ship's electrical wiring. According to witness Lentz, who was stationed in the electrical power plant at the time of the accident and had most of the ship's electric indicators, fuses, and circuit breakers under observation, the various circuits were functioning normally just prior to the conflagration. No fuse blew or circuit breakers operated at that time. It was also observed that the cable carrying the current to the stern light was very sturdy and was installed so as to provide plenty of slack to compensate for expansion and contraction of the frame of the ship. Spark in gas fullness or pressure indicator A theory introduced by witness Heinen was that the cause of the fire was due to the ignition of such mixture in one of the gas fullness or pressure electric meter actuating units fixed to the axle corridor in the vicinity of cells number four and number five. He believed that a small pocket of gas accumulated in the folds or ridges of the cells surrounding the corridor and found its way into the inner recesses of the meter and was there ignited by an electric spark. That the fire thus created traveled up along the radial wires to the space between the cells and the outer cover, igniting the free hydrogen collected along the longitudinals at the top of the ship on the inner surfaces of the outer cover, that the relatively slow burning of such free hydrogen would account for the peculiar manifestations of illumination described by certain witnesses, that the fire in the second sequence then destroyed gas cell number four, as seen by witness Loy. With regard to the presence of gas in one of the meters, it was estimated that in one hour 
the seepage in the axle corridor would have amounted to one fortieth of one per cent of the volume of the corridor that even in the motionless condition of the ship the corridor would have been well ventilated due to the chimney effect created by a wind of six knots blowing over the gas shafts that the ventilation in the corridor would have prevented pockets of hydrogen from forming because the air current through the corridor was not laminated but was made up of whirls and eddies however if it could be shown that a rent occurred in a cell below the axle corridor then it is possible that some free hydrogen might have found its way into one of the meters in regard to the ignition of such mixture within a gas pressure or fullness meter the following is quoted from a report of the bureau of standards relating to exhibit seventy four one of the meters taken from the ship it is evidently intended for measuring and giving a remote indication of small gas pressures by electrical means the gas pressure acts on a diaphragm in opposition to a helical spring a plunger attached to the diaphragm carries a coil of wire which has a resistance of 100 ohms two rollers connected in parallel make contact with the sides of the coil two flexible connections run to the ends of the coil the change in the relative resistance of the two parts of the circuit between the contact rollers and the ends can cause suitable electrical indicating instruments in the control cabin to indicate the position of the coil and diaphragm and hence the pressure all electrical parts are enclosed in a cylindrical metal box the only openings into this box are one the hole ten millimeters in diameter at the top through which the operating rod passes with a clearance of not over zero point zero five millimeters and two the opening at the bottom which is completely filled by the three conductor cable covered with metallic braid which connects to the rest of the circuit the conical housing surrounding the metal box is well ventilated the device seems to be excellently designed and constructed from the standpoint of safety and there appears no way by which it could with any reasonable probability have caused a fire an overheating of the device by short circuit seems impossible a short circuit external to the device would impose on it only the full voltage 24 volts of the circuit and produce a rate of heat dissipation of less than six watts a short circuit inside the device would not draw more than the one milliampere fixed by the external instruments a simultaneous short circuit both inside and out would blow a fuse if one was present before a dangerous temperature was reached good practice requires such fuses on all such circuits and one was probably used the normal operation of the device should produce no sparks deterioration of the contact rollers or of the coil or a breaking of a wire inside the metal box might produce a spark inside it seems impossible that hydrogen should be present inside as it could get there 
only by diffusion down the narrow clearance between the operating rod and its guide tube, 50 millimeters long. A spark could be produced outside the box only by the breaking of the three conductor cable. This cable is strengthened by the metallic braid and runs in a protected location along the structural member. It could not be determined whether or not the cable was definitely anchored to the member, nor whether the metallic braid was originally clamped to the metal box because of damage in the fire. In the light of all the available evidence on this point, we believe that the possibility of igniting such mixture by the means just described was very slight. Resonance effect High frequency inductance An attempt was made to discover if the ignition of such mixture could have been laid to spark emission due to resonance effect upon metal parts of the ship's interior caused by received radio waves of high frequency. There was, on the field at Lakehurst, a localizer beam radio transmitter of low power, maintained by an airline company, the on-course portion of which was so situated as to pass through the space occupied by the ship at the time it took fire. This transmitter was at that time about 1,800 feet from the ship. Its power output was 15 watts, its frequency 278 kilocycles. The maximum field strength authorized for this type of station is 1,500 microvolts per meter at one mile, which represents 15 ten thousandths of one volt per meter measured at one mile on the on-course portion of the range which, incidentally, is the area of weakest radiated power. The strength of this field is so low that it has been compared to the power of a fly. So far as could be determined, this localizer was the only transmitter that was operating at Lakehurst at the time in question. It is not believed that other high-frequency stations, at some distance from the field, could have had inductive effect upon the airship. Witness Diekmann of the German Commission stated that he and his colleagues had been particularly interested in the possibility of ignition through high-frequency radio induction, especially after hearing the testimony of Witness Freund, who was engaged in paying out a length of the stern cable at Ring 47 when the accident took place that this part of the cable might have received impulses and thus electrical energy would have been conveyed into the inside of the ship. However, it appears that if such result was to occur due to inductive effect, a transmitter relatively close to the ship and of considerable power would have had to be operating at the time of the event. These conditions were not present. Resonance effect due to high-frequency generation within the ship was impossible because all the ship's transmitters had been shut down before the appearance of fire. Furthermore, once inside the ship in the form of oscillations in the structure, no damage could have been done because the structure itself was so large and so complex that there was no possibility of a small amount of energy setting the whole ship in oscillation, and that oscillation in separate parts, which perhaps contained high resistance, would be short-circuited by other parts of the ship. In view of the facts and the expert testimony given on this possibility, 
it may be said that in such inductance there was only the remotest chance that it was responsible for the elusive spark electrostatics under this designation of electrical possibilities there is now to be considered a group distinguishable from current electricity and known as electrostatics in this group there is first mentioned a possibility due to the nature of the materials employed in the older type of cell fabric containing a rubberized element it was apparently possible to create a static spark by tearing the fabric the cell fabric used in the hindenburg as far as we could learn did not include material possessing this characteristic since virtually all of the cells were consumed by the fire no test could be made of the cell fabric the two bungees in the stern of the ship connected to the horizontal members of the tail contained some rubber but as far as we know the bungees had not been damaged until after the fire had broken out before proceeding further with the subject of electrostatics it is to be remarked that an airship as a body is regarded as carrying an electric charge the nature and extent of which depend upon the circumstances in motion it may accumulate a charge either through friction with the air or perhaps by means of charged water drops such as may be found in clouds or mist it may accumulate a charge of either positive or negative sign thunder clouds may carry a positive or a negative sign according to the evidence in this instance the ship is assumed to have carried a positive charge on its outer surface which is a semiconductor this phenomenon is due to the fact that an airship in flight is within the atmosphere which is electrified a few of the more interesting features of this phenomenon are that the earth ordinarily is charged negatively that in the atmosphere there is an electrical field measured in volts per meter potential gradient which in fine weather amounts to one hundred volts per meter becoming higher as the weather grows more disturbed that the tendency is for an equalization current to pass from the atmosphere to the ground that the electrical conductivity of the atmosphere is greater when the atmosphere is humid other facts and assumptions are that the total outer surface of the ship has a uniform potential that the electrostatic effects on the outside of the ship are separate and apart from those on the inside that a number of conditions tend to equalize the potential of the ship with the surrounding atmosphere among these is the dissipation created by the exhaust gases and by the movement of propellers the edges of the latter being metallically connected with the ship's structure that the landing ropes would serve as conductors of the ship's charge and equalize the potential of the ship with that of the ground when the ship is held by the landing ropes the electrostatic picture is such that the surface of the ship after a brief interval so to speak becomes a piece of the ground elevated into the atmosphere the potential differences measured vertically to the earth are called the potential gradient this gradient is higher over those areas of the ship where the edges or points project into the atmosphere especially over the bow and stern of the ship 
it may be increased in the presence of charged clouds the principal protection against an electrostatic discharge which might serve to ignite an inflammable mixture in or about the ship is the bonding of the ship briefly such bonding is the connecting up of the many parts of the ship so that electrically it becomes one complete metallic whole a possible test of the state of this bonding could have been made by detecting through the radio receivers the characteristic noise associated with interference created by imperfect bonding in the present instance as has been noted the receiving system of the ship did not give indication that any injury had occurred to the ship's bonding prior to the accident we have also considered the possibility that due to a discharge between parts of the ship having different potentials a spark might have been created whether such a discharge occurred we cannot say according to the testimony the ship was bonded in keeping with the best known practice there was one fixture of the ship in this respect that received more than passing notice the unbonded electric wires at the stern electric lamp of the airship witness diekman indicated that there might have been a static charge produced by this tail light wiring at the light bulb since the wiring within it was the only part of the ship which did not have the same potential as the remaining surface of the ship a very small difference however whether such a small electrostatic capacity as the lamp terminal would have been able to produce a spark is highly questionable another reason to regard it as improbable is that no one reported having seen the origin of the fire at the extreme rear end of the ship ball lightning a reading of the record reveals that some space is given to another manifestation of electrostatic discharge, namely, to the possibility that ball lightning might have accounted for the ignition of the mixture. Ball lightning is supposed to be one of the peculiar species of lightning discharges that have been observed from time to time. One of its features is that like a drop of oil on water it spreads and splits into segments some of which segments continue for a distance along objects on which they alight although some authorities have disclaimed the existence of ball lightning we have considered the idea for what it might be worth it does not very well explain the slow burning that some of the witnesses describe as having taken place at the beginning of the action. Moreover, the theory as applied in the present instance would appear to have little substance since no one testified to having observed any form of lightning. For the same reason, any other claim made on the ground of lightning as a cause would also seem to fail because none of the witnesses who testified stated that they observed any lightning flashes in the vicinity of the ship or heard an accompanying clap of thunder at the time of the accident. Brush Discharge or St. Elmo's Fire in order to develop the next possibility to be considered viz ignition due to brush discharge or st elmo's fire a few additional remarks are necessary upon the subject of electrostatics and the conditions that actually prevailed at the time and place of the accident it will be recalled that the bow port trail ropes first made contact with the extremely wet ground four minutes before the fire 
when they left the ship they appeared to be quite dry as dust was observed to fly from them as they descended these ropes were made of hemp the atmosphere at the time and place of landing was humid and the ship had absorbed moisture it was therefore reasonable to suppose that in the interval the ropes continued to absorb moisture and their conductive qualities increased therefore their contact with the ground under the circumstances would discharge the static accumulated on the ship laboratory tests were made by the national bureau of standards of the electrical conductivity at various humidities of a section of the bow port trail rope to determine whether the static discharge accumulated by the airship was or was not discharged when such rope made contact with the ground under the varying conditions employed in the tests it was found that the airship would be ninety per cent discharged in a period of from zero point six seconds to one hundred and seventy seconds after such rope came in contact with the ground with respect to the potential gradient existing in the atmosphere in which the ship was standing witness f w reichelderfer navy areologist indicated that conditions were favorable to a steep potential gradient due to the existence of a thunderstorm condition witness eckener also believed that a high potential gradient existed at the time and place of the accident he apparently based his opinion upon the following that a thunderstorm front had just passed over the station that the heavy rain had become a light drizzle thus reducing the potential gradient materially and that from his information the appearance of the sky showed a light stratus ceiling he proceeded to say that if one closely examined the current registrations of winds temperatures and pressures then one might recognize that the first thunder front must have had a smaller lighter one following it that the wind turned back to the southeast winds of the higher altitude remained westerly the barometer curve showed a slight falling off of pressure and relatively the temperature started to rise again that is after the temperature had been brought down appreciably by the breaking in of the cold air the temperature remained constant for one half hour before the landing maneuver to one half hour after the landing maneuver then the temperature again started to decline rapidly and the wind slowly turned back to the northwest this according to the witness the sensitive instruments show and that if this was not noticed at the field it was quite natural because attention was focused on the landing maneuver and on the handling of the ship he stated confidently that there was a small tail end to the first thunderstorm that passed by which most likely created a steeper potential gradient than would otherwise be expected whether this stronger gradient could have generated sufficient potential between the airship and the air masses above the ship so that an equalization of the gradient took place either by st elmo's fire or by a spark he was unable to decide that the ignition was not effected by such a static equalization spark immediately after the landing lines had been dropped was because they then were dry hence poor conductors they slowly became damp in the light drizzle that was falling and in such condition their conductivity became greater therefore he believed that the potential between the ship 
and the ground was slowly equalized and afterwards the potential gradient between the ship and the overlying airspace was sufficient to generate these static sparks witness whitehead in commenting upon these views respecting the potential gradient said that if a secondary storm was present in sufficient intensity to cause a spark of lightning of any character that it would have been visible or audible at any rate it would be reasonable to suppose that probably because of the preceding thunderstorm the potential gradient at the time and place of the accident was somewhat greater than normal witness f a l darch areologist at the naval air station appeared to have a somewhat different opinion he stated that previous to the landing there had been heavy showers which could have produced a strong potential gradient but whether that still existed at the time of the accident when only a light rain was falling with just the clouds above he could not definitely say he did not believe that the potential gradient then existing was dangerous to the ship but he had no way of verifying his view in answer to the question after the thunderstorm had disappeared and the wind and rain had decreased were there any signs or indications of a new small depression or squall witness darch said that the only indications they had had was the temporary shift from southeast to southwest with the slight about one one hundredth of an inch rise in pressure however no distinctive clouds of precipitation occurred with this change brush discharge ordinarily is seen only after dark it is manifested particularly from sharp points or projections of any material object that is charged to a sufficiently high electrostatic potential so that the charge dissipates the effect is produced by particles of the material substance or by ionization of the gases of the atmosphere from impacts or stress the ignition of a combustible mixture of gases in such a discharge is due to transformation of kinetic energy into heat from impacts of ions or particles the brush discharge appears either reddish or bluish depending upon the electrical sign of the charge during the course of the public hearings the question of whether a brush discharge would produce sufficient heat to ignite an inflammable hydrogen air mixture was dwelt upon to a considerable extent since that time further experiments have been made in the high voltage laboratory of the national bureau of standards and it has been found possible to ignite hydrogen by a brush discharge by using somewhat more intense discharges than those previously tried with a somewhat slower velocity of the gas passing the needle point in this consideration of the possibility of brush discharge it is to be noted that no witness testified that a visible indication of it was present this however may be accounted for by the fact that darkness had not yet fallen at the time of the accident witness whitehead was of the opinion that the continuous presence of brush discharge sufficient to cause the ignition would require a greater current intensity than could have been possible through a dry rope another argument against the brush discharge theory advanced by witness whitehead was that there was much evidence that the first sign of fire was through the translucent skin at the point well away from the tip of the fin 
witness Diekmann, in elaborating on this phenomenon, stated that a one-hundredth or one-thousandth part of a watt, perhaps less, was all that would be necessary to ignite a mixture of air and hydrogen, that it was difficult for him to believe that brush discharge was responsible for the ignition, that none of the witnesses testified to its presence. He remarked upon the testimony as to the presence of glowing reflections of fire which had moved from the stern forward, but stated that such references to reflections were peculiarly indefinite and uncertain. Of related interest to brush discharge was the opinion of witness Earl that in an atmosphere of high humidity static electricity could be attracted to the top points of the ship when the ship's mooring ropes came into contact with the ground sufficient to cause a spark to jump across the mixture of hydrogen and air saying that such would be possible if the ship was in relatively slow motion while gas was being valved placing a layer of gas between the ship and the damp atmosphere the concentrated atmosphere between the cloud and the ship would reduce resistance to sparking and if the potential of the ship was the same as that of the ground there would be a possibility of sparking across that it is easier to spark through hydrogen than through air the meteorological records and related data of the investigation were made available to dr w j humphreys of the united states weather bureau he has concluded after making a study of such material that a brush discharge or several of them very well might have occurred on the ship after not before the landing ropes came into contact with the ground that this brush discharge would have continued for some time that it would have been invisible being in daylight that such a discharge likely would have ignited any adequately rich stream of leaking hydrogen that reached it and that from the point of ignition the flame would have shot back to the leak there quickly would have burnt a larger opening and set going a conflagration of great violence and rapidity conclusion the cause of the accident was the ignition of a mixture of free hydrogen and air based upon the evidence a leak at or in the vicinity of cell four and five caused a combustible mixture of hydrogen and air to form in the upper stern part of the ship in considerable quantity the first appearance of an open flame was on the top of the ship and a relatively short distance forward of the upper vertical fin the theory that a brush discharge ignited such mixture appears most probable respectfully submitted south trimble jr solicitor r w schroeder assistant director bureau of air commerce and dennis mulligan chief regulation and enforcement division bureau of air commerce approved daniel c roper Secretary of Commerce. End of part five. Appendices of Report of Airship Hindenburg Accident Investigation by the United States Department of Commerce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Appendix 1. Note. 
asterisk indicates those who died in accident officers and crew on board the airship hindenburg on its departure from frankfurt am main germany on may three nineteen thirty seven were as follows captain ernst lehmann died captain max prus commanding survived watch officers albert zampt survived heinrich bauer survived walter ziegler survived navigators max zabel survived franz herzog survived christian nielsen survived kurt bauer survived radio officers willi speck chief radio operator died herbert dova survived franz eichelmann died egon schweikhard survived engineering officers rudolf zauter chief engineer survived eugene schäuble survived wilhelm dimmler died elevator men ludwig felba died ernst heuschel died eduard butius survived helmsman alfred bernhard died helmet loy survived kurt schoenherr survived electricians philip lenz chief electrician survived josef liebrecht survived ernst schlapp died mechanics walter bahnholzer died eugen bentele survived rudy bialas died august deutschler survived Jonny Dörflein survived Adolf Fischer survived Albert Holderied died Richard Colmar survived Robert Moser died Alois Reissacher died Theodor Ritter survived Raphael Schredler survived Willi Schief died Josef Schreibmüller died Wilhelm Stieb survived Alfred Stöckle died German Zettel survived Riggers Ludwig Knorr Chief Rigger died Hans Freund survived Erich Spiel died 
Stewards. Heinrich Kubis. Survived. Wilhelm Bala. Survived. Fritz Dieg. Survived. Max Hennenberg. Survived. Severin Klein. Survived. Eugen Nunenmacher. Survived. Max Schulze. Died. Frau Imhoff. Stewardess. Died. Dr. Reutiger. Ship's doctor. Survived. Cooks. Xavier Meyer, chief cook, survived. Richard Müller, died. Alfred Stöfler, survived. Alfred Grötzinger, survived. Fritz Flacus, died. Werner Franz, messboy, survived. Observer, Captain Anton Wittemann, survived. Appendix 2 Passengers on board the airship Hindenburg on its departure from Frankfurt am Main, Germany, on May 3, 1937, were as follows. Adelt, Gertrude, Berlin, Germany, survived. Adelt, Leonhard, Berlin, Germany, survived. Anders, Ernst Rudolf, Dresden, Germany, died. Balin, Peter, Washington, D.C., survived. Brink, Berger, died. Clemens, Karl Otto, Bonn, Germany, survived. Dana, Hermann, Mexico City, Mexico, died. Dana, Irina, Mexico City, Mexico, died. Dana, Matilda, Mexico City, Mexico, survived. Dana, Walter, Mexico City, Mexico, survived. Dana, Werner, Mexico City, Mexico, survived. Dolan, Curtis, France, died. Douglas, Edward, New York, died. Erdmann, Fritz, died. Ernst, Elsa, Hamburg, Germany, survived. Ernst, Otto C., Hamburg, Germany, died. Feibusch, Moritz, Lincoln, Nebraska, died. Grant, George, London, England, survived. Heidenstamm, Rudolf von, survived. Herschfeld, George, Bremen, Germany, survived. Hinkelbein, Klaus, survived. Kleeman, Marie, survived. Knucher, Erich, 
Zeulenroda, Germany. Died. Leuchtenberg, William, New York. Survived. Mangone, Philip. Survived. Mather, Margaret. Survived. Morris, Nelson. Survived. Olochlin, Herbert. Survived. Ospun, Clifford. Chicago, USA. Survived. Panis, Emma. New York. Died. Panis, John, New York, died. Reichold, Otto, Vienna, Austria, died. Spey, Joseph, survived. Stöckle, Emil, survived. Finholt, Hans, Copenhagen, Denmark, survived. Witt, Hans, survived. End of Appendices End of Report of the Airship Hindenburg Accident Investigation by the United States Department of Commerce Recording by Scott Daniker Elizabeth City, North Carolina www.zeppelfart.com